Welcome to a leadership edition of the Total Picture Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Clayton. According to my guests today, the key to advancing gender equality is men. Joining me are David Smith and W. Brad Johnson, authors of Good Guys, How Men Can Be Better Allies for Women in the Workplace, published by the Harvard Business Review Press. David Smith is a professor of sociology in the College of Leadership and Ethics at the U.S. Naval War College. And Brad Johnson is a professor of psychology in the Department of Leadership, Ethics, and Law at the United States Naval Academy and a faculty associate in the Graduate School of Education at John Hopkins University. They are co-authors of Athena Rising, How and Why Men Should Mentor Women. Welcome, David and Brad. As the father of three girls, I was uh, immediately drawn to your new book. Uh, I've spent enough time in male-dominated industries and organizations to have seen firsthand the disadvantages that women have. According to the preface of Good Guys, your book, Athena Rising, was the catalyst for writing your new book. Can you give us some background on how Good Guys came about? Yeah, certainly. And thanks for having us here today, Peter. Uh, Brad and I got our start, uh, I don't know, eight, nine years ago now. And we were both teaching at the at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. And when we wrote the book, Athena Rising, it was largely to address the issue in particular about how men did not see or engage in issues around gender equity largely. And we started with a focus around mentoring and sponsoring relationships, which we know are really key to advancing in the workplace. And, and the fact that men, the minute they, they saw something as being a uh, women's initiative or a gender initiative, they kind of tuned out and said, oh, that's not for me. That's a women's issue. That's not a leadership issue. And that uh, I think readdressing and reframing these in particular gender equity issues as leadership issues helps to show men that they do have a role and what that would look like in particular. And so we started that work around Athena Rising and, and focusing on what great mentoring uh, relationships look like, especially across gender in particular for, for engaging senior men. And we do find that this is largely uh, when it comes to mentoring a numbers game, right? That there are just not as many senior women there to, to mentor and sponsor a lot of the junior and really high potential talent that's coming in the front door there. For women and that men have to be engaged in doing this work otherwise they just it just was not going to happen and so that's where we that's where we got our start and it was really interesting that um as the book came out in 2016 a year later brad and i were busy talking about the book and, and doing workshops with organizations and uh, me too went widespread around the around the world and really had a profound effect on the work that we were doing and it really Found, we found ourselves being pulled more into these conversations about not just the, the narrow area of mentoring and sponsoring that often we find around more senior people, but really the, the broader aspect of how do men just show up every day in the workplace as allies? And what did that look like? And what was good allyship? And how did women consider that and see that? Um, so from there, I'll, I'll let Brad tell you a little bit more about uh, how, we, how we went about doing the research and the work that we're doing today. Yeah. So, Peter, it may not shock you to know that when Dave and I got started, uh, you know, with our idea for Athena Rising, we would share, we were excited, right? We would share this idea with colleagues and they would say, um, you realize you're two dudes, right? And you're going to write a book about women. Is that a good idea? And we really got it. We really understood that. And, and, and so I think it's really important for listeners to understand our methodology. So Dave and I, as behavioral and social scientists, went out and gathered all the data we could find, all the research on what great cross-gender mentoring and allyship look like. So we began with the evidence and then we went out and did our own large qualitative studies. So we, in the case of Athena Rising, interviewed lots and lots of women asking them, hey, what has a male mentor looked like for you in terms of something that was really effective? Almost every woman we interviewed had had at least one male mentor along the way. And so they gave us the behavioral illustrations. What did it look like in real time practice? And we, we compiled all of those to really sort of develop our, uh, you know, sort of guide for men on, on how to do this work more effectively. We use the same methodology for Good Guys, our most recent book, but we asked women in that case, 
what has it looked like when men really show up as allies, as advocates, as uh, co-conspirators to make the workplace more fair? And, and again, we've put all that together as sort of the, the tool kit for dudes on, on how to show up and be more effective as allies uh, with their female colleagues. Well, you know, as, as you said, you, meant, you, you interviewed a, a number of men and women in writing Good Guys, men who are considered to be allies to women in the workplace. According to the women you spoke to, what traits define their male coworkers as allies? And are there any traits that seem to be consistent across the board? Yeah, maybe I can begin, Dave, with the interpersonal, and you can jump in with sure. some of those more public uh, things. So, you know, when we were doing the research for good guys and learning uh, about the experiences of women in the workplace, the thing that really uh, occurred to us after, you know, just a couple of months of doing the interviews, Peter, was that there were two large categories of things that women said really mattered. And number one was the interpersonal. Dave and I kind of framed this as how do you show up interpersonally as an ally with your female colleagues? And I'll cover a few of the best practices there. The other big category though was the public systemic allyship where men really have to illustrate allyship in their behavior and holding other people, not just themselves accountable. So on the interpersonal plane, a couple of the biggies that came to mind, and I think the first one really surprised Dave and I, both with Athena Rising and with good guys, it was guys, could you learn to listen more effectively? So apparently we men are not so good at that, right? We, a female colleague or a mentee comes to us and we immediately want to solve a problem for her or fix things. And women told us in the interviews, no, really, could you just listen? Sometimes I just need a sounding board. Um, I need you to sort of uh, offer a listening ear and to do that generously, you know, without the intent to fix something or solve something, just kind of be in my corner. Could you avoid assumptions, right? As an ally, can you not assume what I'll want or I'll not want in my career because I happen to be a woman? Get to know me, ask the right questions, do the discernment, find out what my career dream looks like, not what your dream for me looks like, you know? So that humility, the discernment, the listening, and one last one I'll add just sort of on the relational plane, if you're a guy who's mentoring a woman, you cannot forget the sponsorship, right? You have to sponsor her loudly. We had so many stories from women, uh, you know, and the data shows that women get far less sponsoring than men. And we had so many women say it made all the difference when he would talk about me when I wasn't even in the room, right? When he would be my raving fan, when I, I could count on him to always have his ear open for those next opportunities. And he would put my name in, right? He would mention me. He'd say, you know, who you should consider for this uh, so-and-so, maybe Sarah. She's a rock star. And I, I really see her as a great candidate for this. The sponsorship has got to be deliberate and men have to get more comfortable with that. But but Dave, some public stuff. Yeah, you know, one of the things that came out of that interpersonal also was the humility piece. The fact that, you know, I maybe I don't have all the answers and I, and I do have to begin to think a little bit about having this learning orientation and developing an awareness of how others people experience the workplace different from myself. And, and that really came out loud and clear on the public side of this because men, as they would tell us about how they developed an awareness of some of the very maybe unique things that women experienced that they had not experienced in the workplace, then they, they said, ah, now I see the problem. Now I can fix it. And this is part of the challenge, right, is in allyship is we have to be able to see the problem, you know, developing an awareness of what it is, and then we can actually do something about it. And so great example, I would tell you from the interviews that Brad and I had uh, for both books was women telling us over and over again that in you know, in meetings, they would, they would contribute to the team, they have an idea, they put it out on the table, and, and everybody would be just kind of like, oh, okay, whatever. And then three dudes later, he'd repackage the idea that she just put out there as his own and take credit for it. And now it's the greatest idea ever, right? It's like, wow, Brad, how'd you come up with that? That was incredible, you know? And it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, how is that any different than what she just said? But I remember when Brad and I were hearing these conversations in the interviews with women, as they were relating these stories to us that I would just shake my head. I'm like, I have never had that happen to me. 
never personally had that happen to me. And I asked Brad the same question. You've ever had that happen? No. Um, and so he, here's something that if you're not aware of it happening, how can you ever fix it, right? So now I have an awareness of it. Now I'm looking for it. And so when I see it happen, now I can choose to do how I'm going to actually publicly confront at that point. And for women, you know, they, they related all of these experiences and they're well documented in the research as well that, again, in having their ideas stolen. Oh, by the way, women call this bro appropriation or sometimes some of them called it he peating as well. Uh, so they have terms for it that they, they talk about in their own circles that they share with us. But they're also, they don't get as much time, right? As much airtime to, to voice their ideas and, and their contributions are interrupted three times as much as men uh, are. And that happens all the way up to the most senior parts of organizations. So understanding and developing an awareness and a situational awareness of what that looks like in the moment, right? Is part of a, a really important part of allyship because now I have to decide how, what am I gonna do? And then, you know, and then obviously when guys talked a lot to us about the fact that they were, really sensitive or, you know, kind of risk averse to the situations where they have to put themselves out there publicly. And this gets, but this gets back to the public allyship and why it's so important because women are watching and they told us this, they're watching that, hey, if, if you are one of these supposed allies out there, then you better be doing the work all the time. You can't just say it when I, when it's just me in the room or, or other women that are in the room, you have to do it even when we're not in the room. And guys talked about how this is hard. They're worried about, you know, losing their, their man card or violating some sort of bro code you know, with, the, with the guys out there. But again, the research shows us that um, the bystander paralysis is real. And that if we don't say something in the first few seconds, the likelihood of anything happening is probably pretty, pretty slim. But when we do say something, if we do anything to kind of disrupt the moment, the status quo of what's going on, it's interesting to see it makes a huge difference in everybody else in the room, right? And, and Brad and I are, we, we use a technique we call the ouch technique that others have used as well, that we think it's really interesting because you can say anything in the, in the moment when that sexist comment or bias comment gets made, you can just say, ouch. And then everybody's gonna look at you and it buys you a few seconds to think about, all right, so now what am I actually gonna do about this or say in the moment? Um, so confronting and putting yourself out there is really, really one of the more difficult things I think that men uh, talk to us about. And then there's the organic, the uh, organizational or systemic issues too, and and those are really important too because as we develop an awareness of how, how bias affects different outcomes, in particular things like pay and benefits and, and advancement, we have to begin to call that out and begin to think about how do we change the system so that it works for everyone out there. You know, I want to bring up something that you mentioned earlier, and that is the Me Too movement, and it seems to me that. Um, it, it's got to be somewhat disconcerting at this point for men to be very vocal and very supportive and become you know, strong mentors, especially of young, attractive women. And, you know, how do, how do you avoid coming across looking like you're hitting on somebody when you're just really trying to help them? Yeah, uh, this is one of our favorite topics yeah. recently to talk about. So I'm glad you asked that, Peter. You know, there there are a lot of false narratives about Me Too. And the most important and pernicious one is that, uh, you know, women are dangerous or scary now, right? Post Me Too, not safe to interact with. A uh, lot of research coming out of Lean In and other organizations showing that up to 60% of men in corporate America now are saying, I'm just less comfortable having a mentoring conversation or coffee or whatever it is uh, with a woman at work. So we all need to push back on the false narratives, right? Women are not more dangerous. Uh, you know, women are asking to come to work and not be assaulted or harassed. Really low bar for men uh, to get over. And, and the false idea that women make false accusations against men and any measurable number is just ridiculous. And the data doesn't exist to support that. So what can a guy do? It's a great question. And, and Dave and I are really big on guys contextualizing their offers. Uh, you know, if I, if I see a talented junior woman in my workspace and no one's mentoring her, I, I, should, I should step in, right? I, I should offer uh, a mentoring conversation. And, and this is what you don't say. I'd like to mentor you 
right? I, and I just use my creepy voice, Peter, but uh, that you know that nobody knows what that means, and she might feel uncomfortable with that. There's no context. But if I say, "Hey, I saw you in that meeting uh, last week. Give that great." presentation, I thought to myself, wow, the hiring committee sure got it right bringing you on board. And I sure hope we can keep you here in the company. If you'd ever like to talk about next steps or how I can support that, drop by, open door, happy to chat with you. That is really clear and it's contextual. You've also done some affirmation in that. There's very little room for you know uh, concern that other things might be intended there. Um, the other thing that I would recommend to men is uh, mentor a lot of women. Don't mentor just one. When a senior guy doesn't mentor women and then suddenly starts spending a lot of time with just one junior woman, that looks creepy, right? People mm -hmm. wonder, and you, I think you're inviting gossip. As an alternative, if you're a guy who mentors a lot of men and women, uh, there's just no story there, right? There's no gossip. That's just your brand. It's who you are as a leader. And I think, I think you've essentially taken the wind out of any gossip if you are, are deliberate about mentoring more than one woman. No, I think that's some, some really good advice. And one of the things that you wrote about in your book was to, you know, to invite um, you know, someone you're mentoring to dinner and have your wife join so that there's no sense of impropriety at all because your wife is with with you and so that i think that's that's a great solution to that kind of a situation too yeah creating some familiarity right and understanding and relationships amongst those people i think is really helpful you know one one of the other things that we found even before we wrote the book good guys was in our first book that there were there were a lot of reasons why men uh, before me too didn't you know, we're hesitant to engage in, in mentoring relationships or close professional relationships with women at work. And there were so many of them, we called it the reluctant male syndrome. The, and there was just, just real quickly, there were a number of them. And sometimes it was implicit associations or unconscious biases about how we perceive each other in the workplace. And so for men in particular, if they saw women as not being strong enough or not, you know, able to cut it as a leader, not leader material, you're certainly probably not going to invest in them from a from a mentoring perspective. And some men even talked about how they saw women mostly from a nurturing or caregiving perspective. And so suddenly they became this ticking time bomb of maternity out there that they were going to suddenly have babies and and lose them. Right. So there's this sense of this perception of how we see each other in the workplace that we have to come to grips with as well. The, there was certainly a, a lot of anxiety around what does a professional relationship look like in the workplace with a woman? Because guys talked about, hey, you know, I have a social script. I have a man script, or as you want to think about it, for how to relate to a lot of women in my life. And they were mostly women that I grew up with. And my mother, my sister, uh, for men who are partnered with a woman, their wife, um, some men talked about even with their daughter, right? So very comfortable with what those relationships look like and what they're all about. But the minute you, you come back into the workplace and you say, now I want you to have this close, intimate, non-sexual relationship with a woman in the workplace, guys were like, yeah, I don't feel like I have a script to follow. And so, you know, so what do you do when you're anxious? You avoid it, right? And, and the solution to this is not less exposure, not less relationship, it's more. We need exposure therapy. The clinical psychologist there is nodding his head at me and saying, yeah, more and more and more, right? So we need more coffee, more lunches, more mentoring, more opportunities to collaborate and work together. So we begin to get to know each other more, right? We're more comfortable in these kinds of relationships out there. But the, the reality is that it works in many ways, you know, it's the opposite, right? We have this, we're working against each other. And sometimes it's even, guys will do something even worse. And this is that we might follow some of the, the man scripts that we have been socialized with in terms of like the father daughter. And again, not necessarily something you want to uh, invoke when you're in a professional setting, right? Because that can be, again, might, might be feel like a little disempowering or undermining to, to treat or patronizing even to treat a, a woman or a mentee as, as your daughter at work. And um, the other one that we, we often find in a lot of traditionally male professions and industries is the, the knight in shining armor, right? This notion of chivalry. 
and again, it's this sense that men are there to rescue women and, and women don't need to be rescued, right? They need to be heard and they need to be valued in the same way that other men are out there. So we just ask, you know, again, that men check in with themselves a little bit about, hey, if that's something that, you know, you would typically follow in terms of a relationship, you might want to think about is that how appropriate is that in this environment, in this setting? I know that you have done research with um, multiple industries, public and private sector companies. Is there any industry or vertical that's doing a better job at this than others? Or any, anything that really stood out in your research? You know, Dave, I, I want you to jump into this too, but I, I, I think my perception of this, and I want to check with you, Dave, but my perception is it may not be industries, it just may be specific companies within those industries that have really made a commitment uh, to getting it right and doing better. And, um, you know, a, a couple of, of shout outs, I, I guess, in terms of companies that we really see doing a lot in this area, and there, there are a lot of them. Um, you know, Facebook uh, has is launching uh, a male allies uh, community, and they have done all kinds of uh, in-house training around allyship. They're making it a priority. They're holding people accountable. PNC Bank is started in a really nice grassroots male allyship community within the company and are really kind of driving uh, men to be more engaged in gender equity conversations and, and and to really develop the skill set that goes with male allyship. And, and so I see it as, as companies that are making a commitment and I, I see them across industries. But Dave, does that dovetail with your experience? Yeah, I, I think it I think it is because I think in general what we find are leaders, senior leaders in again, uh, very traditionally male dominated industries and professions like STEM, right? Or like tech finance, law, the military, government, you can go on down the list, right? That when you have senior leaders in those industries and organizations that understand the value of, of what uh, diversity in particular, and but widely, but in, in women bring when they are represented across the organization, they understand the business case for it. And they understand how it makes um, not just that they're making more money, uh, which I think is, you know, again, important for the for the private corporations in particular, but um, even in public uh, organizations, the government and the military, right? That they're more likely to meet their mission. And I think, again, that's that has a higher calling and I think is really critical and important. But even broader than that is the, the organizations that do this better, they're better places to work. They're just, they're more enjoyable. We find that in terms of, of retention uh, of, of the key talent there. You feel people, see people are more connected and feel more belongingness. There's much more organizational commitment and identity. And, and again, it's just a, a greater place to work. And, and you find that broadly in those cultures of those organizations. And it, it often starts with the leaders uh, being in touch with understanding why this is important to them and why it's important to their company. Yeah, and, and along with that, uh, there are a number of companies now that are tying compensation mm. to their diversity and inclusion efforts. And that will get your attention, if nothing else, right? Absolutely, yeah. If you put it in the performance review criteria <laughs> or your performance evaluation criteria, you, you know you're going to be held accountable for it. And not, and not just the human resources officers and not just the chief diversity officers and their people, but the people that actually are in P&L positions, right, that are in charge of the, the main business outcomes. That's where it really makes a difference. The, uh, the current world we're living in seems to me to have raised a, a number of interesting issues directly related to gender equality. First, guess what? You can actually work from home and be effective. All of a sudden, the idea of everyone must come to the office to get work done has been shown to be, uh, I guess you'd call it a male fantasy. So, so what's your take on this? Yeah, I, I think we've seen that. And but the you know the interesting part of it is that I think as we hopefully are coming out of this over the, in the coming year, uh, that the things that we've learned, the, the takeaways, the and the best practices from the work from home pandemic situation that we've been in 
um, have been some crisis, one that's been some crisis leadership issues, in particular, I think leaders understanding what people need when we are in a crisis. And I, I think, again, leaders have had to, to reach into some other traits and skill sets that they haven't necessarily you know, used in the past and that, uh, and developing empathy and developing connection and showing that you care for your employees and, and finding ways, not just that you're talking about it, that you're actually doing things. And, and we see that from everything from reevaluating performance review criteria that were often written before the pandemic started, but now reevaluating and checking in, having managers check in with all their direct reports on, on their specific needs and requirements. Because again, um, Lots of people are under a lot of strain and stress from a family, from a health, from an economic financial security perspective. And they're having, they're being forced to make some really hard choices about work and, and family, what they're going to do. And in particular, what we've seen is it's been exacerbated in, for women. And some of the, the things that existed before the pandemic have been made worse. And we've actually been able, you know, shining a spotlight to some extent on these issues. Uh, the fact that women have been largely doing two to three times more of the domestic responsibilities and the childcare before the pandemic has been even worse now during the pandemic and and, and you know the, the homeschooling piece right the child care piece the homeschooling piece of that has made it even even worse for them and so we see that in the outcomes when it comes to unemployment numbers over the last few months that it has uh, largely affected women much more than it has affected men and we see really the opposite for men in some cases where m many more men are taking promotions and advancements and pay raises whereas women are being forced out of the workplace to a large degree. So uh, you have an entire chapter titled To Be Legit as an Ally, Start at Home, <laughs> which I think it has taken um, on a, a new meaning and importance here. Can you share with us some strategies when you have two parents working from home on Zoom calls with kids and cats and dogs and chaos on a daily basis? Yeah, it, it's such a good point, Peter. And I'm really glad you brought this one up because, you know, very often when Dave and I are working with men uh, who would like to be better uh, as allies with women in the workplace, um, um, we often hear them saying, hey, how do I gear up? How do I get started? Uh, you know, how do I do these ally skills? And you can see the look on their face. There, there's a little bit of shock and disappointment when guys say, uh, or when Dave and I say to them, hey, if you want to do this work, you've got to start at home. You cannot show up and fling on your ally cape uh, at work if you're not doing the work at home. And so the data, uh, as Dave was saying, before the pandemic showed that women who are partnered with men, even when both are working full time, on average, you're doing two to three times more of the domestic work, the child care. That's all been exacerbated during the pandemic. Um, and now we find that women are doing the lion's share of the homeschooling. There, you know, Cheryl Sandberg has called this a double-double shift uh, that women are doing now during the pandemic. So message to men. Um, it's great that you've been home maybe more during the pandemic. It's great that you've gotten a front row view to all of the stuff that your partner has been doing. Now you have to go and do a domestic partner audit. You have to ask, if, you know, especially if you're partnered with a woman, you got to ask her, am I doing everything I can do to be a full partner in terms of all of these aspects of domestic work? And by the way, it's not just vacuuming and doing the dishes and childcare. It's the cognitive emotional labor, right? Am I helping you keeping lists and keep track of things? We tend to just automatically default that uh, to women. So I need to do that audit. I, and then when I get the answer from her, I need to not be defensive and just ask, how can I step up today? How can I begin? And, uh, and so that, that's really a mantra for us. Men need to start at home. And remember, this is also great for your sons and daughters. In fact, it's crucial, right? So great evidence showing that when a daughter has a father who is a genuine partner at home, she's more likely to go into non-traditional careers. She's more likely to sustain uh, in those careers. When sons see a father doing those things, he's more likely to go to the workplace expecting egalitarian mutual relationships uh, with women. So for all of these reasons, men have got to step up. And last thing here, 
you have to role model this. It, you, for too long, men have been sneaking out the side door at work when they have an obligation at home, right? We keep it secret. Maybe I have a parent-teacher conference. I, 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 I sneak out. I need to do this stuff publicly. When I have something at home, I need to make it clear to my coworkers. I have an obligation. I'm going to step away. When I when I step away because we've had a child, I'm going to put it on my email, uh, you know, response that hey, can't respond to your email for the next two months because I'm taking my full parental leave. Men need to role model this for junior men, and we need to normalize it for our female colleagues. So, absolutely right. To be legit at work, got to start at home. Why do so many women choose careers in HR? Virtually every CHRO I know is a woman. Yeah, it's so interesting, you know, that there are particular occupations and professions and industries out there that are that are that are dominated by women. Um, certainly human resources is one of those out there. And and I think to a large degree, you know, some of this was a offshoot um, again, this is just kind of my opinion. I don't know the, necessarily the, the the research on HR in particular, but that uh, that these were kind of the places where women, you know, the kind of work that they did. It was a lot, largely a lot of the the administrative work that was not part of the business. And, and it, I think in some ways, um, it was part of the, the sex segregation that we see in occupations and types of work that we do. That, that human resources was seen as as kind of the well, that's the that's well, that's people work, right? That's that's for women to do. The, and it could be, uh, you know, I think it's largely keeping them outside of the, again, the, the key positions, right, that, that have kind of helped them be part of work, but at the same time, not be able to advance up into the, uh, into the upper echelons of, of a lot of organizations out there. And it's a leftover, it's a holdover, I think, that we still see, right? And, and that, oh, you know, and largely that men look at that and there might be even stigma associated with men being involved in that kind of work out there today. And I, I, I have another theory I would just add to that. And I don't know what you think of this, Dave, but those jobs often pull for better EQ and communication skills and relational skills. And so I, in some ways it feels natural to me that, that women would find that they're quite effective in those jobs that demand better EQ. What we're finding ironically is that we need EQ up into senior leadership in the real business units. Um, but historically that, that may not have been recognized. Although, you know, I cover mainly HR tech and, and recruiting and talent acquisition um, the space and and I can tell you that when you look at what's happening today in um, in with HR technology and with uh, you know the, the talent acquisition tools that are being used, the, the the role of HR has been elevated and it's becoming much more of a strategic role than it used to be. Um, so and, and on, like I said, every, every CHRO I know is a woman. So if you want to advance in a corporation, where's a good place to go? Well, HR, right? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, certainly. So, um, well, speaking about that, last week I, I participated in an HR Tech Alliance's virtual event that showcased uh, several companies in workforce analytics or people analytics and, and the data these companies are able to extract and analyze is really amazing. Uh, one company called Claro had a nifty chart called female representation in the workforce and leadership positions. So companies being able to hide behind opaque PR is quickly becoming a thing of the past. Do you, do you think more transparency will motivate companies to become more gender diverse in their leadership? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it's certainly something that we found from a best practices uh, perspective in the, in the work that we did for good guys, that uh, companies and organizational leaders were looking for ways to be transparent. And they talked about it in terms of how they would um, strategically message one, the work that they were doing. So if they had a, a diver any sort of diversity and inclusion initiative out there, that they would make sure that they were, they were talking about it 
broadly and publicly in their company so that people saw that it was important to the senior leadership, but not that they were just talking about it, about what they were doing, but they also talked about how how they were doing it and, and the progress they were making, which I think gets to your point there about the analytics because progress is important. It's one thing to talk it, but people wanna to see today, they wanna to see the action that goes with it. And it's not always gonna go exactly the way you want it to. And so some of the leaders talked to us about how, yeah, you know, it didn't maybe didn't work out as well as we wanted to initially, but we made adjustments as we learned along the way. And then we talked about that to our, to our employees. And what's really important about that, I think, for leaders out there is to understand that this develops trust with your employees because again, they want to be heard. They want to know that they that you care about them and, and no matter who they are in the company. The other part of this is there's an external piece to it from a transparency side and around public disclosure. And companies do this in a variety of different ways. Some of them are putting it out there on their, their forward facing web pages. Uh, they might be putting it out in particular reports and reporting requirements that they have and depending on uh, you know, where they're operating and what countries are operating out there. But com companies today are talking about it. Hey, we need to be publicly disclosing how we're doing. When we talk about this internally to our employees, we want to talk about it externally to our investors, our potential investors who are looking at companies and how they're doing at this, because they recognize that it is, again, a key enabler towards, again, being more profitable and successful. The other piece is around talent. And again, uh, the research shows that uh, the more diverse the talent is, the more they're looking at your company in terms of what are you doing? Not just what are you saying, but show me what you're doing and how you're doing at it. Show, it shows that openness and that, that kind of a company that they want to work in. And they're much more successful in recruiting that diverse talent out there. What are the two or three most important takeaways from your book? So we have to distill down to two or three, Dave. That's a, that's a that is a challenge. Maybe four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, maybe we can just kind of alternate here. So mm -hmm. I'll 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 start with one. Um, you know that that comes to mind, and I think it's really relevant right now during the pandemic, uh, especially Peter. And that is men have got to initiate mentoring with women and. And I can no longer uh, live by this illusion that uh, women can just be mentored by other women. Do senior women mentor junior women? Of course they do. There just aren't enough of them. The math doesn't work. So if we're really going to make change uh, around equity, if we're going to promote more women, men have got to mentor women deliberately. And that's got to include the sponsorship. So I have to look around. I have to hold myself accountable. I have to ask myself, uh, there are these talented junior women around me. They're not being mentored. Uh, how can I step up and start initiating some relationships? And remember, it, it, it takes away the gossip if I'm mentoring multiple women. And if you're a guy who's uncomfortable with this, how about doing, doing a group, right? Invite three or four high talent women to your office every week to have a conversation about careers. There are a lot of ways that I can wade in here. But if I want to really move the dial in my company, a key thing I can do is start looking deliberately for the people that are slipping through the cracks around mentorship and sponsorship. I think one of the important messages that Brad and I have is that remember that, that gender equity and, and diversity broadly are not, these are not issues for those groups. So for gender in particular, this is not a women's issue. This is a leadership issue, right? For our no matter whether you're in a company or you're the leader of a government or whatever the, the level that you're at, this is a this is a leadership issue and you have a role. So men have a role in this and one, they need to accept responsibility and accountability for doing that work. And that means they're going to have to begin to develop that awareness. They're going to have to take time to understand the issues that they haven't experienced. And there are a lot of them out there. And, and the other half of that, I think, again, we talk a lot about gender partnership and remembering that allyship really is about partnership. It's a collaboration between us that um, women have to make space for men too. And, I, and I, you know, I'm very, very careful about how I say that, but that we have to be included. We have to see it makes a difference when men are engaged in doing the work for too long. It, this has been put on women to do all of the work and we really, you know, to a large extent have kind of leveled out in terms of advancing gender equity in our society. Uh, it's really over the last 20, 30 years, we just haven't seen a lot of movement in that. 
And that's because largely because men have not been engaged in doing the work. We've got to find ways to include men and to show men that, that, that they are welcome here. There is a place for them. There's a role. And we've got to begin to, to show them that they can execute that role. They can do the work in a place um, that is welcoming to them as well, right? Uh, even in a space like an employee resource group for women. There is a place for men there, and we need to think about what that space is and, and where men uh, should be involved in that work and how they should show up to do that work. Understanding that, again, these were places that were safe spaces for, for people to go in and share experiences and some of the challenges they've been dealing with. But I think it's time that we start working together on these. Yeah, and here's another one, Peter. This is one Dave and I really like, and we think it's crucial. Um, men have got to learn to decenter. And, and what I mean by this is we are typically privileged in any space in the workplace. People look at us. They expect us to speak first. They, they give us more airtime. Um, you know, we get opportunities. Um, men need to become aware of this. You know, in a typical meeting, who does everyone look to to start the meeting? Who's talking most of the time? Who's getting interrupted? Who's not even invited to crucial meetings? I have a role to play in making sure that my high talent female colleagues get the airtime, right? And one way that I do that is just to step back. I don't always have to be in the spotlight. And there are a lot of ways that I can do that lateral pass to her, right? Um, say, well, that's my two cents, but I, I'd really love to hear from Kathy on this because she is clearly the subject matter expert and I've learned a lot from her about this. So, you know, that, that took me 10 seconds, but I just gave her crucial airtime. And I, that needs to be a practice for more men, stepping back, making sure that women are heard and, and seen in meetings. I'll add one last one here for you. And that's really around men getting comfortable with this conversation. Uh, there's a certain amount of clarity we have to begin to get comfortable in a uncomfortable situation. Uh, men often talk about how they're uncomfortable talking about gender or diversity, these issues, and they need to, they need to start dealing with that discomfort a little bit. Part of it can start with understanding your own personal connection about why this is important to you. And, and what does that narrative, what does that narrative sound like so that you can communicate that to others around you? Because women are going to look at you when you start doing the work around allyship, if you haven't been doing it before publicly, they're going to start looking at you and wondering, you know, can they trust you? Are you really, are you really sincere and authentic in doing the work? Or is this just some sort of performative allyship that they've seen before that you're going to turn around when, when nobody's watching and you're going to go back to your normal ways? Um, but they're watching. And so we need to be get comfortable talking about it and why it's important to us and that we can start to develop that trust again with our female colleagues at work. Well, I think that's some, some great advice. And uh, I really enjoyed your book. Appreciate um, that. So how can, uh, how can our listeners uh, connect with you guys? Yeah, they can uh, go to our website, which is that workplaceallies.com, workplaceallies.com, all one word. Um, and you can certainly see the latest of what we're writing and where we're speaking and things that we're doing out there and the work that we're doing. There's some tools of, as well on that website, as well as uh, how to get to the, the main toolbox there, which is the book itself, Good Guys. And we hope uh, hope people get a chance to go out there and, and read the book and then go on Amazon and review it and talk to their colleagues about it. Great. Well, again, thank you very much for taking time to speak with me today here on Total Picture. It's been a pleasure meeting both of you. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Hey, it's Peter Clayton. Please hang on for just a minute. Like most of you, my business was completely upended by COVID-19. Instead of filming marketing, sales, testimonial, and product demo videos at conferences and corporate offices, I'm living on Zoom. Zoom can be an effective video tool for many kinds of powerful content. As people have become more comfortable being on camera and upgrading their video streaming capabilities, we are now able to create high-quality, entertaining, and informative videos using the Zoom platform. Virtual meetings, customer testimonials, product demos, marketing pitches. You'll be amazed at the video quality and the amount of sophistication and graphic complexity we're able to create. For a free consultation on how you can use video to market and promote your business, send me an email, peter at totalpicture.com, 
and check out totalpicture.com forward slash work. I look forward to hearing from you and thanks for tuning in.